Well, I was going to say good morning, but it's good afternoon. And uh, you've all been uh, very patient, and it's truly an honor and a delight to be here and hopefully help contribute to our thinking about this very critical topic. Uh, so let me uh, sort of, using the American phrase, uh, as, as a cleanup batter here, we're in baseball season. Uh, and I know in many Latin American countries, it's a love sport as well. Uh, perhaps uh, offer a few thoughts that are um, in reaction to Dr. Freed's comments and others during the course of the day. Uh, the first one is to take the why portion of Dr. Freed's opening title of why we're here. Uh, and I was a little surprised, actually. I think there are um, perhaps three reasons we're here. One, we've all articulated very, very clearly, and that's that we're living longer by decades. And if science and medicine has anything to do with it, we've, we're just getting started. This is a great celebration, but it also is transformational. But the second reason we're here, I listened very carefully, and if I missed it, I apologize to someone who might have raised it. Um, but it certainly wasn't broadly discussed. The second reason we're here is that we're not making babies uh, in many countries around the globe. Uh, and certainly among the G20 countries, which include a number of countries represented in PAHO. Uh, and this fact of not making babies seems to be pretty close to 100% correlated with trends of modernization and urbanization, which I think of certainly during the course of the 21st century will continue. Uh, the third element is circumstantial to this moment, not inconsequential. It is that baby boomer bulge that we talk about are the 450 million who are turning over 65. If you redo your definitions and you go under 60, you get you know over well over uh, half a billion people um, worldwide. So. I would suggest the reason we're here, therefore, is that there is, we are at a profound transformational change that we've never seen before in the history of the world. And it's not only about the longevity, which is new, and we all know that, but it's about the proportion of over under 60. And everyone has alluded to that, but it's that detail that is so critical and also connected, again, very much to the title that Dr. Fried had about uh, aging must be part of the public health agenda. Though I would also suggest we broaden that and say aging must be part of the broader public policy agenda, as you just suggested. And I would then go back and suggest that in that context, healthy aging is, as it were, a means to an end. Healthy aging and health policy is a pathway toward active aging. Now, I know that's controversial in many circles, um, but let me back up and tell you why I'm suggesting that. Uh, we were at a conference. We helped to uh, prepare and lead. Uh, last year, uh, a couple, at the beginning of uh, 2011, when the US hosted APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Council, which, as we all know, included a number of countries that are in PAHO, not just the United States and Canada, but also Mexico, Peru, Chile, um, and of course, mostly throughout Asia. And just to give you a little anecdote there, uh, you know, we're sitting around a table uh, with the countries from South Korea, Japan, uh, China, all of whom have very, very old populations, and particularly old populations as defined by young versus old, as it were, uh, each perhaps for different reasons, but we'll leave that aside. And probably one of the most passionate, informed, and articulate voices around that table was from the Minister of Health from Thailand. Because she was looking at a young population and looking at the Koreans, the Japanese, the Chinese, and saying that we have to begin to prepare for that point 30 or 40 years from now when we will be there? And what do we do about 
healthy and active aging in that context. A second point connected to that uh, is that in that region as well, as many of you may know, a small country, but one that we tend to learn a lot from, Singapore, uh, is now struggling with such a disproportionate dependency ratio, close to 40% of their population in that sense, um, so that they've had to take over a new policy to provide incentives to bring people back to work who are over 55. So let me then, with that as sort of context, come back and ask the question, if we're engaged here, and one congratulates both PAHO, the WHO, and the global health community for celebrating aging populations this year as it's World Health Day, um, and we say, let's wind the clock forward to 2030 or 2050, what does success look like? So I would suggest three markers. The first one is a culture, a culture shift, a very fundamental culture shift of how we define aging, how we define old, how we define seniors. And in a way, I look at success as we may actually have a reduction in older populations because we will no longer call people under 75 old. The new middle age may be from 55 to 75. If we're living in a period where we're living through to 90 and even 100 and beyond during the course of this 21st century, we have to rethink how we define aging, how we define young, middle age, and old, which will then have impact on our social and economic sets of policies. Sarah Harper, who runs the Institute on Aging at Oxford University, gave the London, uh, she gave the London speech uh, for Oxford University this year. And in it, she gave an interesting detail that a young girl who's born in the mid-90s, who was born in the mid-90s, is likely in our era to live three centuries. Obviously, most of her life will be lived during the 21st century, but she is likely, given what we're doing with longevity, to live into the 22nd century. In that context, we need, we need to redefine how we live our lives. The second point that I would suggest is that what is required is no less a construction than for the, a new social contract. The social contract under which many and most of our societies live, in one way directly or another, is one that was essentially invented by Bismarck at the latter part of the 19th century, where that magic age of 65 was a time that benefits kicked in, largely health and retirement benefits. It was very easy because most people were dead by then. This is not the case today, and will be less the case over the next 20 or 30 years. So we need a new social contract which suggests, again, that our conversation here is as much about what are the institutional and policy changes that we need to make as it is about old seniors per se. But as was said very clearly, and as we've learned from projects like the Age Friendly City Project, if we get it right for older people, we will get it right for the society more broadly. Uh, not only health policy, but education policy. Both are examples that basically were invented in an earlier time for an earlier set of demographic realities and are not fit for 21st century new demographic realities. We've already heard a lot today about health policy. Education policy is similar. The idea that someone goes to school and finishes in their early or mid-20s has to be outdated. And the idea that the only place that we learn and are educated and develop our skills and understanding is only in school. There are responsibilities both socially and out of economic self-interest among many organizations, including business, to become age-friendly. So I would suggest that this is about basic public policy questions of how we need to change 
to enable what we're calling our aging populations to become economic growth drivers, to get to a place where governments, on the one hand, think of their aging populations, where business, we have this global coalition on aging, which is basically business-centered, where business looks at its aging workforce as drivers of growth, as economic opportunity, in their own economic and fiscal self-interest. And that is what really will be transformational. So perhaps let me just uh, conclude my um, remarks uh, by attempting to at least suggest some uh, answers or directions to think about answers to the question that was put earlier of how do we revitalize the agenda. So you, when you introduced me, you, uh, and I appreciate it, said that you attended some of our meetings at the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, which I have the honor and pleasure of being responsible as an adjunct senior fellow uh, for uh, aging populations. When I first went to the leadership at the Council on Foreign Relations and said and began to talk to them about establishing a fellowship program on aging populations, they said, what does that have to do with international affairs, global politics, or America's foreign policy? And of course, a week and a half ago, Under Secretary Hormatz came to the Council on Foreign Relations and talked about this topic of aging populations as a core driver, an underpinning of America's foreign policy. A second example is that, as I alluded, uh, we have this global coalition on aging. And by design, it is cross-sector and it is cross-discipline. And there are companies from technology, whether it's Intel or Microsoft, companies from the healthcare and pharmaceutical world, whether it's a Galderma, a Pfizer, a Lilly, a Bayer. I'm, I'm leaving some names out, but you get the idea. The banking, banking sector and the financial services sector. And each of them are in this coalition because they see this topic of aging populations as in their economic self-interest. They have joined this coalition not from the standpoint of what we refer to as social responsibility, which would be a nice thing, but they're there because it is in their self-interest because they see that this demographic shift in the 21st century has huge opportunity on the economic side. So having this centered in the World Health Organization and PAHO is a great place to start. Getting our topic on the agenda of the G8 or the G20, having it as a core concern of the World Bank, having it inside the discussions across agencies, including the ones that are around this city, but in many others, that are not just in the health arena, but also in education, in treasury, and many others, will then be able to truly revitalize the agenda. Because it will be understood that this is truly one of the most transformational topics of our era. As Laura Carsonson of the Stanford Longevity Center has said, it is a prism through which we understand new opportunity in the 21st century around social, economic, and institutional change. So again, let me uh, conclude there, and hopefully there's going to be a very lively discussion. Uh, but you know, I would, I would end on the uh, simple, uh, but I believe profound point, as uh, Linda so eloquently said, uh, this is new. We have never done this before. No one has ever done this before. We can be forgiven for not exactly getting it right. We cannot be forgiven for making mistakes and moving forward. It requires creative thinking. It requires innovation. It requires boldness. And I believe that, again, having this as a topic, as the centerpiece of the World Health Organization, and with organizations like PAHO driving it, we can get there. So thank you very much.